TK. Hey. We've been friends for quite a few years now. Wow. Um, quite a while. And I think one of the most amazing things that I've kind of seen throughout the years that we've been friends is the the transitory period between going from a non-creative career to you know what you do now as a full-time creative. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, what you've been doing previously, uh, and we'll get into that in just a second, are, are two very different things compared to what you're doing now. But you know, why photography? Why creativity? Why something creative? And you know, has creativity always been like a part of your process? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I guess when I was younger, I never saw myself as a creative person. I was always it's quite academic, good at sports, those type of things. So that's kind of where I led to my career, which was physio initially. Mm. Um, I didn't really have an outlet for creativity throughout that time. And what kind of got me into photography was probably maybe because I didn't have something like that. Mm. Um, I got to a point through work where I was, I don't know, I guess a bit stuck. I wasn't enjoying it that much and kind of started shooting a bit more. Yeah, and that right. is, I picked up a camera when I traveled. That was kind of where it started. Mm -hmm. And I shoot a bit when I traveled mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed that. But once you get back, never really did anything with the photos. Um, sit there in a hard drive and run yeah, away. Maybe not even on a hard drive <laughs> at that stage, but um, I really enjoyed it when I traveled. And that was about the extent of it. Mm -hmm. I think Instagram was the big starter for me. Instagram was pretty young in those days, but. A lot of people were sharing photography stuff and I think one day I just decided to make a photography page. I had kind of a few photos from travels and stuff and I just started posting a few of those and that kind of where it started. I started meeting a few people through Instagram and mm -hmm. stuff and it all kind of snowballed from there really. Nice. So mm -hmm. prior to, to photography and, and you know physio, mm -hmm. just all sports? Pretty much like growing up, I played every sport. I played cricket at high, quite a high level. So that those things kind of took up a lot of time when I was growing up. Yeah, right. And that was probably my, I guess, outlet away from school and mm. and all those and work as I got older. Those how, type of things. How did you do at art in in school in high school? Terrible. <laughs> so I think especially when you're younger, or maybe even when you're older, depending on what you view. I think. Creative, you think, are you good at drawing? Are you mm. good at those type of things? So I was never good at any of those things. So that's why I saw myself as not very creative because right. I couldn't draw, couldn't, couldn't paint, couldn't do the typical kind of creative things that we kind of put a, into a kind of label on ourselves. Mm -hmm. mm. It's, it's very interesting because like um, in contrast to, to me, like I have been a creative my entire life. Yeah. You know, my mom was a, a creative you know she used to be a musician she used to play piano she used to do art you know yep. she does drawing all these kind of things like and so i was really engrossed and uh you know around that environment when i was growing up so yep. I, I think it's super interesting for you to you know be so successful at what you're doing now but not have that kind of like background i think you know it, it is a, a long journey for you know how you learn the skill set yeah, of, sure. of creativity. So what, what are the kind of like challenges that you have had to face in, you know, the past, I think, how many, how long is your career now? Like six years, seven years? Yeah, probably full time. It's been, it's a similar timeline to yourself, actually. We, we kind of quit at a very similar time, which mm -hmm. has been kind of nice in a way, um, kind of following along in each other's journey, mm -hmm. different, different paths after that, but it's been cool. Yeah, so I'd say like 10 years ish all up but yeah it's probably six years when did i yeah getting on mm. i mean that that kind of like time period is is uh i know i'm feeling it right now in terms of i guess i'm the kind of person who needs a lot of like novel inspiration for mm. things to feel fresh and fun and all that kind of stuff and you know for you how are you feeling now that you know you've kind of created a, a stable uh, career for yourself, uh, you know, establish yourself and, and, and really got into the groove of, of your, own, your own career. How do you feel in terms of comfort of, you know, 
challenge versus novelty when it comes to your own photography right now today? Yeah, I think for me, one of the things like I've always kind of spread myself out quite wide, which I mean, is good and bad in some ways. And it's probably led me to get to a point where I am now where I'm finally a bit more comfortable in what I'm doing. And I'm, I feel like I'm seeing more progression in what I'm doing as well. So that's taken a little bit of time and it's, I guess it's taken a bit of experimentation and trying a few different things like did a few weddings there for a while and things Mm -hmm. like that when things probably weren't as busy or picking up as much as I'd like where I tried a few different things. So it's taken time. Mm. Um, Going back to challenges for me, not coming from that, I guess, creative background, just not having that is a challenge in itself because you don't see it as like I didn't know anyone. I didn't see anyone following those kind of paths. Mm. Like both my parents, similar kind of uni, go to uni, study, get a job type of thing. Same with my sister. So that's the kind of path that I knew. So following a creative path, there's, well, I guess there's no real map for anyone. And that's, it's part of the, I guess it's a great thing about what we do and what creative fields, but it's also quite challenging because Absolutely. there's no, okay, study, go to uni, do this job. Even once you get to the job, some jobs have quite a clear progression path, whereas like it's, there's, there's nothing do, like that. Nothing exactly. Like, yeah. So <laughs> it's very challenging when you don't really know anyone doing that. And that's where like making friends like yourself and like the group that we've had is, is so useful because without that, you kind of, it's kind of hard to see where, like what, where it could take you essentially. So mm. that's on, on that subject, you know. For, for context for the viewers at home, you know, we have a, a kind of very tight knit group back in Sydney and, mm. and you know, Sydney in general has been quite a, a tight knit community, just not just for ourselves, but, you know, a little bit broader and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think that's, it has been really, really special. Um, but aside from that, you know, when you first started photography yeah, and you started coming back from those trips and Yep. You know, having those images and, and not doing anything with them. How did you increase or build upon your creative skill set to like kind of bolster yourself as a creative? Because mm. you wouldn't have had, well, as you mentioned before, you didn't have that skill set coming into to mm. doing photography. So how did you how did you learn to pick up creativity and, and the different pieces around that? Yeah, it's interesting. I think for me, the biggest thing was the enjoyment and the eventual kind of passion that I I had for it because it wasn't something that I was ever naturally good at, especially photography. I quite enjoyed it and even like I liked experimenting with different things without any real guidance, like long exposures and stuff when I first started, just like taking weird long exposures and experimenting and doing stuff like that. I really enjoyed doing it and even playing around in Photoshop and stuff, even though I had no real kind of guidance or experience there like you can just play around with different things and that I kind of enjoyed doing that in terms of photography it was just I enjoyed it really Mm. like it I think things like composition and stuff have really come with time that definitely weren't something that I think definitely for composition and and skills like that some people have it a little bit more naturally but a lot of people like it's, it's just a skill you learn essentially so for me it was definitely something that I'm kind of still feel like I'm improving and learning on so that's just it's just time yeah um but I think you need that spark and that's what it was for me like I was getting a lot of enjoyment out of it I was kind of it was through Instagram where I'd started meeting people and we I would pretty much go on a road trip like every weekend just to hang out and take photos and kind of that's where I met a lot of new friends and I think that enjoyment is where I started to pick up skills because you kind of get excited by it and you you want to share what you're doing and you get better and better um i don't think it was until i really made that jump where i kind of spent a lot more time on improving specific skills like Mm. related to photography though but it's it's kind of a a thing that's time and i guess effort like you do it's it is a lot of time that you put into it yeah it takes i mean the the amount of hours and and deliberate practice that you know professional photographers you know myself included um have to put in is is so tremendous and i think you know there's this there's this 
kind of uh, misconception and this kind of glamour that people who haven't done it for themselves kind of put onto and project onto the people who have done it. In yeah, that, for sure. You know, there's they must be gifted, they must be natural, they must have an innate talent or, or what have you. But yeah, and it's, it's it's true for most things. Like, and I really hate those kind of terms <laughs> because they're, they're, I mean, even when you look at sports, like there's there's some people that are, are they have a gift, but well, they have certain factors that will potentially make them good. But there's so much work that goes into all and. People often just, oh, they're just lucky, gifted, whatever, which is mm. very rarely the case. And it's often a lot of hard work behind the scenes. And I think that's what I really try to express to people because I know like when I picked up a camera, I, wasn't, I was never gifted. I yeah. was never good at it. You're I like, was, what do these buttons do? <laughs> I was not even that, like just like, oh, well, does this composition look good or not? Yeah. I, no idea. And it, it's something you learn over time. And but I think importantly, you do need that kind of spark or interest there because mm. without that, it can just be mundane practice that you're trying to kind of repeat over and over. Yeah. It needs to be a little bit like it, it just happens. Like if you've got that joy, you go out, you want to shoot and that's where you progress if you, if you have that kind of joy for it, I guess. In today's world, especially with cameras that we have on our phones that we carry around with us 24-7, you know, everyone takes photos, but that doesn't mean that everyone is a photographer. There is a difference between taking quick snapshots of our lunch and intentionally using photographic techniques to craft an image that can be art. And if you are looking at picking up the art and the craft of photography in the pursuit of mastery as quickly as humanly possible, then you might find this interesting. So I've spent well over 10,000 hours in dozens and dozens of different countries all across the world, all in the pursuit of taking world-class images that stand the test of time. As a Sony digital imaging ambassador, I've condensed down everything that I know, all the techniques, all of the tips, all of the tricks, and structured them into two different courses for beginner photographers that as many of my students have said, have drastically accelerated their learning. For many of them, just after a single month of doing my courses provided them with the confidence and the technical ability to use a camera to intentionally compose their images and to also start creating a visual aesthetic and a style when it comes to editing their photos. So if all of that sounds interesting to you, then check out my 30-day photography fundamentals course and my Lightroom Editing Masterclass over at patk.com forward slash courses. And to celebrate the launch of this brand new podcast for the month of April in 2024, get 15% off with the code made at checkout. That's patk.com forward slash courses with the code M-A-D-E at checkout. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Now back to the episode. What of uh, style? Style mm. in photography, style in, I guess like, you know, at a broader level in terms of creativity in mm. general, um, you know, style I think has, is one of those things that is just so nebulous to nail in terms of a definition. Yeah. Um, and there are so many different facets of uh, style that you can work on. And so when it comes to to photography, you know, for you, how do you define style and kind of what, what have you done in the past to uh, develop it over time? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one in terms of defining it. For me, in, in a photography field, it comes a lot from your subject matter. So what you choose to shoot or what style of photography you choose to shoot. And there can be that real intersection between photography styles as well. Um, even within that, I guess what you're, how you're choosing to shoot within that. And then I think the editing process and how you, you choose to manipulate your images in different ways is a big part of developing a style as well. And I think that's what a lot of people think when they think of style, it's just how you make your photos look in the developing stage. But style is a lot more than that at the same time. So it's that kind of, it's a real combination between them all. 
and for me, developing a style again, it's just something that it takes a lot of time. Like, and you, you, you don't even realize you have it once you get to that point. Mm. Like I'm sure people, and I get it all the time, and you have a particular style in how you edit or how you shoot. I'm like, you, like do you, I? And <laughs> cool. You, yeah, you, you <laughs> kind of do over time, but it, it kind of comes without realizing. Yeah. And that's where, for me, it's, I guess, it's just, it's a mash of everything that you've probably studied and enjoyed in the past because a lot of it's what you go out and choose to shoot as well. So having that clear intention, again, is really important. Like if, even within street photography, if, if there's like a certain style of street photography you like and you want to experiment with, you go out and shoot that, that really develops your, your style as mm. well because you have that clear intention of what you're going out to do. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I definitely agree. And and one of the reasons why I asked you about style specifically is because I think, again, you know, with with myself and my own background, I've had so much kind of influence mm. that shaped my style in so many different ways um, that I could draw from. And I, I definitely see, uh, and it's been nice to see along, as you mentioned before, the same like kind of time frames that mm. we both have. Um, your style in terms of not only visual aesthetic, but like I think the the maturation of you know subject matter and the maturation of where you decide to go and 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 all of these different kind of aspects of style. Um, I've seen that change for you quite a bit over over the years, for sure. And it's been really nice to see. In terms of it, like I know it's not deliberate, but if someone was like, you know, how do I find my style? at a tactical level like what kind of advice would you give them yeah that's a, a tough one and i was just kind of thinking about that in my head and kind of wondering your thoughts on the same thing <laughs> to me i would almost say pick and it's hard because a lot of people say oh you're just copying people but i would say like pick or find some photographers you really love and it, it can be within different genres it doesn't have to be all portraiture or, or street photography whatever it may be because usually especially when you're starting out you might have quite a mixed mixture of things mm, like a lot of different subjects and a lot exactly. of different categories and stuff so like that. if you can find a select few that you really like and look for some maybe common themes within them and then experiment with that go out and try and capture those things if it's a certain time of day even certain kind of light whatever it is that you can kind of find some some common paths for i think that's a good probably a good way to start but it's a it's a tough one it is a and tricky one because <laughs> i know it's something you think a lot about on yeah this stuff as well yeah for me it's it's very much about you know every uh creative endeavor that i've ever tried to do there is a, a an amalgamation of things that makes up your style, mm. you know, how you shoot, what you decide to shoot is, you know, way more important than the the Lightroom preset that you put on at the yeah, end exactly. of an image, right? So, you know, visual aesthetic is important to get me wrong, but subject matter and all of the decisions that lie behind composition are, in my opinion, definitely way more important than, yeah. than just the end result. Yeah, it's interesting. I've heard a lot of people ask the question, like, can you fix a bad photo with an edit? And, like, I've heard people say yes, and I just disagree with that <laughs> wholeheartedly. Yeah. <clears throat> like, you can improve a photo, but you can't make a bad photo a good photo from an edit. Yeah. Which is what I definitely used to try to do <laughs> when I started out. I'm definitely guilty of that as well. Yeah, for yeah, sure. <laughs> and so, you know, photography now, it's, you know, we've been both been doing it for, for quite some time now, quite some number of years. And, you know, for us specifically, I think it's, it's quite safe to say that photography is the, the major medium to which we have made our creative careers. You know, mm -hmm. I think we're both in the, in the unique scenario where we do both photography and we do YouTube. Um, and so I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about how you essentially made it as a successful photographer in terms of, you know, actually being a full-time creative, actually supporting yourself financially and all of the, the facets around that. So if you could explain a little bit of the, the process and the journey behind transitioning 
between you know your your previous career as a physio to your full time career now as a photographer, in terms of you know how you make money or what kind of process and ideas you were thinking about when when you wanted to make the jump. Yep. Yeah, it's it's tricky and it's it's funny when you say like that we're kind of at this point and you kind of you don't think about it too much and it's we are very lucky to be in this position and it's luck but it's also hard work and then you you think about like kind of how you got here and like it it's definitely not an easy path but like if it's if it's worth doing it's it's, it's never like a, it's never a super easy. simple yeah, yeah it doesn't just just come to you one day so it is i guess been a lot of ups and downs along for me like definitely one of the hardest parts was thinking about that decision and whether I should make that idea. I mean, I was getting some work through photography at the time, but, but not a lot. And for me, I think I definitely needed to make that jump and not have that financial backing coming in regularly to give me enough of a shock to go out there and do a bit more. Mm -hmm. So I was quite comfortable when you, I kind of reduced the days I was working in my previous job. I moved around a few jobs cause I wasn't that happy in what I was doing and lucky that I could drop a day or two here and start to spend a little bit more time on photography. So that's where it started. Would you say this was like in the last like one or two years of your previous career or like, was it like a more drawn out thing, like five years or something like that? Uh, I think it would have been maybe two, maybe three years, but it was kind of back and forth for a little while. So I think the biggest thing for me was I was looking after a clinic. So I had my own business for a while and that's where I was at one stage. Like I was like, as well as doing all the business stuff, I was like practice, like I was working six days a week, treating patients plus all the business stuff. Mm. And I was, this is after I got into photography I was like, don't have any time to shoot. Don't have any time to edit. <laughs> This sucks. <laughs> and that was like, honestly, like it, it made me unhappy. Like I, what most people would think had made it outside that. Like I had a physio business. I was doing well, but I was, it wasn't fulfilling for me. Mm. So it's, it's an interesting one. And the, the biggest thing I probably did was, was sell that. Mm. And then I looked for, initially I just looked for jobs that would give me more time essentially right could still support me but i could still give me a bit more time to do other things what was the process behind like selling the physio business and, and then moving into <laughs> slowly drip feeding yourself into photography i suppose at that point i didn't know but i just knew that i didn't want to keep going down that path mm. yeah that's, that's that's about as much as i knew that's super tough man because i i think you know, I, I have, I was also there um, in the same position where it's like, you know, from the outside looking in, people might look at your life and be like, oh, yeah. you've got this fantastic business. You know, you've got so many clients, you're constantly busy all the time and, yeah, you know, all that kind of stuff. But like, if, if you know you want to do something else and the thing you're doing right now is not super fulfilling you for this current time in your life you know then then it's it's no better than yeah being a corporate slave or like yeah. being chained to doing something that you don't want to do or you know any of that kind of stuff so yeah and it's tough because part of it you think okay i just need to be grateful for what i have and move on and, and keep doing it but like at the end of the day like if you're not enjoying it you, you're not enjoying it like mm. you need to and i think this is like money is definitely the, the driver for this for most people. And that's, that's what it is. Like we need, like f financially you need to be able to do what you need to do. But I think sometimes money isn't like it's for me, it's definitely not everything. And that's, I've never, I think it's good and bad. Like I know I'm never going to make millions because I'm not that money motivated. Like you need to be driven by that to, to really make millions. Yeah. Whereas I'm quite content with being able to get to a stage just where I can do what I need to do that I want to do, like mm -hmm. travel here and there and support family eventually, do all those things without needing much more. Mm. You know, when you were making this transition period between mm -hmm. physio and, and photography and slowly kind of just 
dripping away your hours doing physio stuff. Mm -hmm. What kind of like, did you, are you the kind of person, is probably a better way to phrase it, um, who like kind of sits down and is like, okay, I'm going to do my my financials and I need, you know, I have this many expenses this month and this is the amount that I need to make in order to like cover these expenses mm -hmm. and maybe I make a little bit more and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Like what was the the kind of nuts and bolts of like your decision making to like wean yourself off physio and then move yourself into photography? In short, no. Like <laughs> I, I'm not good at that kind of stuff. Even now with with business, like I think business strategy, planning, all those things are definitely not my strong point. Mm. Um, and that was very true when I made the jump. So I think if you can spend a bit, bit of time on that and, and build those skills, it's it's something I still need to, <laughs> to work on for sure. But for me, it was more, okay, I'm starting to get a bit of work here. Can I make this work somehow? There was not a lot of, I there was a lot of thought in where can I make money? but I didn't put too many figures out there or planning or what I needed to cover to survive that kind of thing. Interested to know if you did a bit more of that, but I certainly didn't. I kind of got to a point where it just built up. And one day I, I rang my boss at, cause I like at that workplace, you didn't, I didn't really see them very often. They'd be in other parts of the airport when I was at Qantas mm. working as a physio there. So like I rang him, I said, this is it. Um, I'm done. <laughs> so that was like two weeks. And um, I still remember that day because I hadn't planned to make that call on that day. Obviously, like this thought had been brewing for quite a few years at that stage, I believe. Mm. But I still remember the relief I had after I made that call and just like the excitement I had. I, I wasn't even worried at that stage. It was just like just sense of relief. Yeah. And it was, it was pretty unreal, but I didn't have a lot of plans at that stage. I had some, but I think for me, and this probably depends on your personality a little bit, I needed that to be free of that, to jump me into action. Right. Because even when I had a day or two spare, when you're kind of comfortable and I was comfortable, I still had some income coming in and making a little bit of photography. It wasn't enough to spur me into mm, action. Right. So you're kind of a, perhaps like a, a burn the boats kind of person. Like I needed know. something. Yeah. Yeah. To light, light a fire. I needed ass. a little <laughs> a spark, maybe not a, a full blown fire, but yeah, I, I needed something mm. for sure. So you would say, would it be fair to say it was only really after you started getting some jobs um, through photography, mostly through Instagram at that stage, At that right? stage, yeah. Um, some jobs through Instagram, and then it just kind of, you know, snowballs and, and more and more jobs come through. And it got to the the critical mass to where, like, you, you know, you, it just kept building and then you were financially sufficient enough and could yeah. support yourself every time. Yeah, and it was, I'm, I know your timing was very similar. I think... Um, I kind of put my notice in. It was probably like, or oh, I finished up November pre COVID, like just before COVID. So COVID kind of hit next the year after, the year after. in like, like kind of April. Right? Yeah. yeah. So I guess that was definitely challenging. We're pretty lucky in Australia. I was just like, just hit the kind of brackets to get a good grant from the government. So that definitely kept me going that year. Without mm. that, I'd, I might not be here. <laughs> I'm sure I would have made it work, but... Thank you, Australian government. <laughs> yeah, it definitely helped. Um, that's not true. I'd definitely still be here because it's not... I'm sure you would be. It's, it's, it was a help, but it, it's not enough to, <laughs> no, to no. do too much with. Mm. Um, but that year was challenging and even the year after was challenging because it, I was still very new to it and I'm, I'd still consider myself relatively new to it in in terms of a long-term career. So that was challenging. I think um, I got through it pretty well in the end. And once things started to, to open up back back in Australia, which, which obviously took quite a while for us there, yep. um, stuff started to come in. And I think the biggest thing for me at that time, and it was probably just before, I was planning to jump into YouTube. I'd filmed some stuff kind of prior to that. 
but being stuck at home, that's when I started my YouTube channel properly as well. So that was probably a, a really important thing in my career, like career progression, just having that mm -hmm. as an outlet. I think even if you, nowadays it, it supports part of my business, but back then I think it just helped bring in extra eyes, extra work, extra clients as well. And I think that's part of the, the side of YouTube that some people probably don't realize. They think, oh, how much are you making from ads? Well, not that much. Mm, no one makes that much really <laughs> but, in the photography space anyway. But it is so valuable. Yes. Like not only for other things outside that, that you're, you're making income directly from, but just for a broader business sense, mm -hmm. I think it's incredibly valuable. So that was a big turning point for me and, and starting that. And So tactically, I guess like we can move into, you know, today's world mm. um, because obviously it's been a, a fair few years since you've started your YouTube uh, channel and, and it's it's grown quite a lot over the, the past couple of years and there's a lot of, as you mentioned, uh, auxiliary benefits to, to having um, a YouTube channel. Mm. I think one of the things, you know, I remember way back when, I think it was like 20, 2018, 2017 or something like that, I had seen some of the Melbourne guys mm. start their YouTube channels and think to myself, oh, yeah, I could probably do that. But then as a photographer, you know, there's this like huge kind of, and as an introvert, you know, this huge kind of fear about putting your face like to the camera, in front of the camera and, and being in front of the camera, being a, a quote unquote personality and, um, you know, getting yourself out there in that way. It's really, really kind of scary. And I think a lot of, Photographers today and, you know, the landscape today in general, mm. I think a lot of photographers see YouTube as as something that everyone knows there's a huge benefit for, but most, well, many, I won't say most, but many people find quite difficult to get into. For sure. So if you, as a photographer who has done that yourself, you know, what kind of advice would you give to aspiring photographers who want to create? A YouTube channel and what are the kind of challenges and, and how did you overcome them in terms of setting up your own YouTube channel? I think the biggest one that comes to mind like straight away is how focused we become on numbers because <laughs> you need to like shy away from that when you start a YouTube channel. If you make a video or two and this is what you see a lot, you see people that want to maybe break into that and, and start a YouTube channel, they, they might start posting a few bit videos and they won't have instant success because it, it can take a bit of time to build YouTube, no doubt, but it, it's definitely worth it. And I think that's probably one of the draw cards for a lot of people. Um, and if I think especially things like uh, Instagram and I'm not on TikTok, but definitely TikTok at the same time, if something doesn't do well instantly, like you kind of, okay, what's next? Mm. Whereas like, YouTube, it doesn't always hit. <laughs> it can take time to, to build. I mean, and that's probably, I think, the biggest draw card for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I think the other one is thinking, oh, I don't want to be a videographer. Why would I make videos? Mm -hmm. Like if you're more focused on photography and that type of thing. Like, and you, I guess my advice there is you don't need to be like a videographer. You don't need to have like, top level video editing skills. You don't need to make your video super cinematic. You still have something valuable that you can share with others. And looking back at some of my videos that have done really well, they're probably like, there was a lot of thought behind them, but they're probably the worst shot videos. Like, and they're still getting views. Like the, it's some of those things really aren't important that we probably spend too much time on when we're starting YouTube especially as photographers, you want everything to look pretty and, and look nice. And the lighting's perfect. And yeah, and I think that's uh, like honestly what stops a lot of people. It takes too much time because they're focused on things that probably aren't that important. Mm. Like honestly for me, thinking about the idea and what you're going to do in the video is far more important than what it's going to look like in the end. Mm -hmm. So there are a few things. Um, but what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Like... Cause you see it as well. And I know you've had quite a bit of success through YouTube. So you're probably, as I am a big advocate for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I've talked about this before, but YouTube, I think for, for me in terms of social media has been the, the number one thing. Yeah. Like there, like 
more than Instagram. And don't get me wrong, I've had, you know, tremendous success on Instagram prior to the, the idea of, you know, virality and, and reels and short form content and all this kind of stuff. Mm. Like Instagram for me was was huge, was similar to you. And, 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 you know, I found a lot of success there. But YouTube, by comparison, just... Yeah, there's no comparison, is there? Yeah, it just dwarfs it. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, for me, some of the, the biggest highlights are similar to what you mentioned, you know, the it's not just having an audience on, on that platform. Uh, it's not just that diversity, but, you know, from a business perspective, it's like these are potential, not customers, mm. they could be customers, but they are your audience that is tied to your business and your brand. Um, and you are building a a very deep well of, of trust with these people far more than any other platform. Yeah, you know, for sure. I think there, there's, I, I talk a lot about what is the value of a subscriber mm. versus like a follower on Instagram or mm. a follower on TikTok or, you know, whatever, pick your, pick your platform. Yeah. Really. Um, and I think on, on YouTube, the value of subscriber is, far greater than any other platform, you know, in terms of loyalty, in terms of potential, uh, you know, revenue generated in terms of trust, in terms of, you know, a whole bunch of different metrics. Yeah. I think that sums it up pretty well. And a lot of people, I've kind of posed the question to myself and others, especially when I had not many uh, subscribers on YouTube, maybe when I was first starting out, a couple of thousand, whatever it was, and you kind of still probably had like 50K or something on Instagram and I kind of put the question, would you like swap your followers, subscribers? And I was like, yes, you know, <laughs> in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. Um, because there is, for me, there's so much more value there on, on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. It's one of the things I wish I got started way earlier. For sure. Than, than I did. If you're a photographer visiting Japan, you probably want all of the most visually attractive, stunning spots to go to and photograph. And in Japan, thankfully, there is most certainly no shortage of that. It's why I've been coming back to Japan nonstop since 2016 and eventually decided to move here as well. But as an English speaker not knowing how to speak Japanese, finding all of the good spots, all of the local spots is hard. And doing all of the research for how to get there, in what season, you know, what gear to use, and all of the other nuances and considerations that lead to a great image, it is tiring and time-consuming. So I've made it easy for you. My photography guides to Japan and Tokyo are the best-selling photography guides on the internet. And I have been doing this for many, many years, so I know a thing or two about it. In them, I show off all of the best spots this country has to offer and how to capture them, saving you time, money, and stress, and simplifying the planning process and enabling you to have a great time here. So if that sounds interesting to you, head on over to patk.com forward slash Japan to check out my photography guides to Japan and Tokyo. And to celebrate the launch of this brand new podcast, for the month of April 2024, get 15% off with the code MADE at checkout. That's packe.com forward slash Japan with the code M-A-D-E at checkout. Thank you so much for supporting this channel. Now, back to the episode. I think the other valuable thing, and I think this is probably true in any creative field, when you're making videos on something and thinking a little bit more thoughtfully about them, spending a little bit more time on them, this is where you get better. Mm. This is what has helped me get better as a photographer, like discussing photography, thinking about photography to make YouTube videos mm. in some way. And they kind of combined and that's like helped me get a lot better. Mm. So there's there's just so, so many positives from it. Yeah. If you can't teach something well or something simply yeah you simply just don't know well yeah you simply just know don't know it well enough wow i butchered that (laughs) yeah but but you you get the idea yeah it's uh yeah i i 100 percent agree and and have the same mentality you know that's that's one of the reasons why i've done beginner basic stuff on youtube for so long 
because you can't ever learn enough of the the fundamentals and yeah. different methods and ways in, in which to teach them. I think even like regardless of your skill level and how high you get up, even rehashing those basics, like there's you're getting something out of it for yourself regardless. Like there's always stuff there. What's the hardest part about being a a YouTuber, quote unquote? I guess like it it is a consist like it's a consistency thing. Mm. And that's like I'm still I wouldn't put myself in the YouTuber category yet, but I probably like should. Like it's a it's getting there for me and I'm trying to spend more time on it. And it's definitely that consistency, which is probably the big challenge, especially when you've got client work, you've got other things that you, you, you're dedicating quite a lot of time to. And again, because you might not be getting that instant, whether it's financial reward, whatever it is, if you're not getting that instantly from something, you might put it more to the, the back corner and spend time on those things that you need to do more immediately. And that's, the challenge I find with YouTube and I'm sure that's like true for a lot of people. So just building consistency is something that I'm really working on. And I see that because I do see the value there, that's what I want to spend more time on and making time for it. I'm very happy that, that you are uh, are coming around to like labeling yourself as a a quote unquote YouTuber. I think labels are really important. Yeah. Um, you know, the story you tell about yourself is like the most important story you'll ever tell. And the the idea of identity and yeah. labeling yourself based and creating an identity based on that, I think is, is really important, especially as a creative. So how do you think about labels just for yeah. yourself? Even when you said that, like labels always, I think I, I, I need to stir away from this a bit because Often I think about them negatively. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I hashed on a little bit in terms of like labeling myself as someone that wasn't very creative growing up. And that can kind of put you in a thing where you avoid creative tasks for quite some time because of it. Um, so labels in that sense is why I don't like them because they can limit you mm. in, in certain ways. So I try not to to put myself in certain boxes or certain criteria. So that's why I avoid using them. But probably, as you say, like you need to to have that story and tell yourself a certain story because it mm. is so important. And if you're constantly trying not to put a label on yourself, you you lose that. Mm. So I, I think they're good and bad, but you need to find that balance. Like even, I'm not sure you found this, but as you started doing more photography, you started to build up Instagram a bit. I was always super reluctant to call myself a photographer. Mm. <laughs> it took me a lot of time to okay and and own it <laughs> and own it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the important thing, right? Like, um, you know, just further to what you you mentioned, labels in my eyes are literally just the 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 box of your identity, mm. and I think it's really important to, for me anyway, to use it as a tool. But knowing that as a tool, it can have both tremendous positives, um, but also very deep and devastating negatives, right? When, yeah. when you refuse to label yourself or you label yourself incorrectly and you start to build an identity that isn't in the direction that you want to head as a photographer, as a creative, as a YouTuber, For sure. or whatever the case may be. And I think that's probably why I made the mistake of spreading myself out across so many different things when I started this journey and it took time to kind of narrow that focus, which is obviously really important and and labels, as you say, I think can really help with that. And that's, yeah, an interesting one. So what, what is then the, uh, the future of your YouTube channel? Because, uh, you mentioned some stuff around consistency. Yeah. So um, it's been a pretty busy start to the year, but I managed to keep up with, with almost weekly, pretty much weekly YouTube videos. And that's kind of the plan this year. So in terms of like what I want to do there, it's just photography stuff really and sharing more about what I've learned through my journey. Um, definitely spending a lot more time on, on street photography. And that's what I've kind of, 
I wouldn't say I've really niched into, but that's what I'm really enjoying sharing and really enjoying shooting. Um, but it's probably not your real traditional straight up street photography. I like to mix in like kind of a travel side to it, I guess, and just kind of, so that's what I'm really focusing on in terms of kind of building my style there and also kind of teaching stuff through there as well. Nice. Mm. So it's a uh, more, you would it be fair to say it's, it's more, I guess, yeah, tutorial based and photography experience based and, For sure. and that kind of vibe. Bit more targeted now than when I started out where it was kind of a bit of everything. Mm. I still like gear and, and talking about gear and stuff because mm. I enjoy that, but mm. um mixture of stuff there as well. Yeah, nice. Mm. So, okay, let me let me preface this. Um one of the reasons why I'm making this podcast right mm-hmm. now and having this conversation with you is because in the past, I would say uh, six months to a year or something like that, I've been pretty kind of bored, um, creatively uninspired uh, with the content that I was putting out on YouTube Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of it was photography basics, uh, photography tutorials, uh, you know, some some stuff on mindset and psychology, which is really nice, especially from a creative twist yep. and a creative perspective. Yep. But I was kind of, you know, jaded with the the things that I was putting out and no longer enjoying it, and that's why mm. you know I'm I'm here doing something completely different mm. in a completely new format, in the hopes of perhaps finding something that is fun for me to do again. Yep. Um, but part of that is, you know, on YouTube, there's this huge, and, and I know it's not just YouTube, but there's this like huge wave of, of it, it's going to sound bad, but like copying people on the platform in terms of, you know, doing the same or very similar kind of videos. So in terms of subject matter and topic, mm. you know, and I think it's it's difficult for photographers you know, there's there's only going to be so many spins you can put on yeah. the exposure triangle, right? Mm. Um, and that kind of stuff. And so you see people copying each other left, right, and center all the time. Yeah, from thumbnails to titles to whatever it is. How do you how do you kind of deal with that? And how do you you know make things fresh for yourself, especially since photography is such a it's not a limited skill set, but it is a, a finite skill set. For sure. Um, it's a tough one. And it's, I think why YouTube's challenging and it is hard to come up with something unique. And I think that's also where people do well because they can come up with something unique. But that's definitely the challenge behind it. For me, I think it's quite similar to what we chatted about in terms of developing a style. Like you don't go and see someone's photo and think, oh, I want it to look exactly like that. You might find certain elements from it that you enjoy and you might intertwine that with something, a totally different idea that you've brought in. So even if you're drawing inspiration from something, I think it's very different to obviously copying something. So I guess... Even at times, I'm sure I come up, like get a lot of inspiration from from other things and, and different ideas, but it's it's trying to put your own kind of spin on it or how you how you use a certain thing or talk about a certain thing, your experience with it, trying to make it somewhat about you because that's what YouTube is essentially, like you're showing yourself. But it, it's, it's, it's a challenging one for yeah. sure. Okay. I mean, and that's, as I said, like that's the challenge in – in succeeding because there is so much similar stuff there. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big pool. Mm. <laughs> it's a big pool of content. I feel like the photography space on YouTube has, has grown a lot in the years as well. So there's a lot there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Moving on a little bit from YouTube specifically, I started this podcast because I wanted people to understand what, not only what it takes to be a full-time creator, but also to illuminate the idea that there are so many different ways that you can effectively make it as a full-time creator and that there there are so many different paths to, to making a life that you love. A big part of that is the, that the fact that 
as a creator, you're never really taught the skills of business or mm. finance or, you know, making money or anything like that. Exactly. In your current situation now, you know, what uh, what do you think is are the main pillars behind uh, being able to continue doing what you love doing in terms of like where, where do your, you know, fi- for example, where do your financial buckets fall? What do you depend on in terms of brand deals or, or you know, sponsorships or what have you? Yeah. Or like, you know, what are your major money kind of levers and, and drivers and, and how does that look like as a picture for you as a creator in 2024? Yeah, I think for me it's something that uh i would say like 80 percent of like overall income probably comes from client-based stuff and that's not just it's usually to do with social media but it's not always having to post to like it's creating social videos whatever it is for for businesses and and clients as well so just everything client-based is probably still the large percentage for me and then youtube everything else it's it's probably more like 70 30 I would say maybe even a little bit higher but it it's it's I'm trying to shift that essentially so and that's where I need to spend more time on things like YouTube and and probably more on the business side of things coming up with with different ways through that to 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 make money because I'm wasn't always someone who was highly fixated on money I think that's where I've probably not spent a lot of time mm. on um, but that's basically where I'm at at the moment. And it's so true, like as a creative, like you need so many different skills. Mm. And at the end of the day, it's not how good you are at the craft that determines how well you will do to, or how, if you will make it mm. in, as such. It's all those other skills that you don't get taught. And I'm lucky in some sense that, I think coming from a different background, I had some very different skill sets there already. The creative skill sets I really had to to learn and start from scratch, but things like rapport and communication, especially for working with clients, I think that's had one reason I've been able to do what I do because I've always been, I guess, working as a physio, you have to communicate very well with patients. You have to build a rapport with patients. You've seen 20 odd a day sometimes. So that's 20 new people you have to Mm. kind of build a rapport with sometimes. So I was that talking to doctors and other medical professionals and liaising with them. You have to get good at those things pretty quickly. So I think that's kind of helped me come across um, to dealing with different groups of people and um, dealing with clients. So that's, that's one skill that I think is pretty underrated and if you want to go down that path with working with people and clients, it's a very valuable one for sure. Soft skills and, and emotional intelligence and, and yeah. those kind of things. Yeah, especially with with your your breakdown being so client heavy, I mm. suppose. Like in that manner, you know, yeah, in, interpersonal skills are tremendously yeah. tremendously valuable. And that's where like as long as you even if you do a good job, it doesn't like if someone does a better job than you and they're really difficult to work with, they're going to come back to you if you're easy, mm. easy going and enjoy working with you. As long as you're still putting out decent output, which is still very important. Of course. <laughs> but the other side of it's very important as well, for sure. Right. And I think that's probably helped me succeed in some way, for sure. So then in terms of of moving forward for you, what you mentioned, you know, you want to balance out the the scales a little bit more when it comes to the waiting for for kind of each uh, bucket of things. What does what does, you know, success for you, let's say five years from now, look like in terms of the distribution for, you know, how your business runs? Um, I would say anywhere, as I said, pretty close to flipping that like 60 40 70 30 in the other direction where it's kind of everything that i'm kind of doing through youtube website sales everything like that is a higher percentage of what i'm doing if i can if i can do that it just means ultimately you have that little bit more more freedom Mm. um and again like i think some people hear that and think yeah 
like, but it's still pretty hard to get to that point. So mm. like it, it's, it's nice, but it takes a lot of work and I think, and it's not instant like gratification No, not at again. All. So that's something I probably challenge with, I have challenges with. And I think that again, that's the challenge of getting into something like YouTube. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, and I ask that because, you know, there are a lot of people, a lot of creatives who really enjoy the client side of things. You yeah. Know, really enjoy servicing clients, really enjoy, uh, you know, big budget campaigns or getting out there in the field and, and, and doing something for a brand that is not their own. Yep. And I think there's, you know, as long as you know what you want to do, I think there's tremendous, like, fulfillment to be found in sure. that um but it is interesting you mentioned that you want to take it more towards a uh, i would say less client side yeah um split yep what kind of skills do you think uh if you are or what kind of skills do you do you have do you foresee yourself working on in say the next five years or so um to facilitate the the flipping of 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 these things i think it's i touched on a little bit it's more those like i guess business marketing type skills where you're kind of because even things like um through your website building email lists and and i have a big email list but i don't use it like right. just simple things like that um that are definitely more on on the business side of things mm -hmm. um that i need to probably work on a bit for sure I think. so it's all well and good to, you know, have something that you're building and, and working towards over a long period of time. Yep. Um, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day and, and neither are the businesses that either of us create. You know, in your own words, how would you define the way that you've made it and then as a successful creator? And then how would you then package that up into like a nice couple of sentences as advice Ooh, that's tough to a aspiring full-time creative person? Okay. So a few sentences. Yeah, it could be a paragraph. If you <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've got time, but. <laughs> yeah, you might need to give me some time to think about this one. It's, <laughs> it's tricky because I think it's not something I really think about. And I think sometimes thinking about yourself is, is hard sometimes. Yeah. And that's why we probably don't do it enough. But I guess my journey, it, some people would say it's been quite fast, but I would still say it's been quite gradual in terms of the skills I'm picking up. Um, it's hard to define it though. Like I'm, I'm really, really struggling mm. to, to, to define like my kind of path, but I think it's because, well, from my perspective anyway, I think it's because you have a very, um, very gradual and a very see how it goes kind of approach. Mm. And I think it's, it's worked out for you because you're, you're, you're always focusing on the next thing instead mm. of getting lost in, in, in the source or lost in the process and, and, and the past and all those kind of things. So I can I can definitely see where for for your kind of personality type would be like difficult to 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 find and articulate that. Yeah. Cuz it is it is so gradual, you know, these things. They yeah. they just build on top of each other. But if you were to give someone an aspiring full-time creative who let's say um has done their craft for you know, 5 years and they've gotten to the point where they they're good at what they do yep but they're struggling with trying to make that transition mm -hmm. and doing what they love full-time what kind of advice would you give to to that person on on how to to transition i guess what has worked for me and and thinking about that a little bit is just setting really simple milestones it might just be and they're never number based so it's not about like trying to grow a certain number of subscribers or certain um, and I might set goals around that, but they're never the main goals. And I think that's really important, not just fixating on that. Cause I think so many people think, okay, if I hit this, I'll make it. But I'm probably a good example of this where 
like definitely followers, subscribers don't bring success. Mm. They can, but they're not everything. So like just because you have a certain number of subscribers doesn't mean you're earning a certain amount of money or going to be able to do this ongoing. And I think that's what I see a lot for young creatives, especially in the world of like Instagram, Mm. where they're so focused on building an audience there. They're probably not not thinking about other things and, and, and business things. And even though I didn't have a very like direct plan, I was always thinking about other things and I was never focused on building to a certain number. I was focused on getting better, getting like doing, working with different clients, building my skills there and, and just getting better essentially at, at what I do. If you're consistent and you keep doing that and as long as you are still sharing things there, you will grow. Like if you're putting effort into it, you will grow. Like it's simple. But if you get too fixated on just growing or this didn't do well or this that didn't do well, like and just too fixated on that, that I think that's probably the trap some people fall into. Mm, yeah, sure. So that's definitely probably my biggest advice for for anyone who's maybe starting to build a bit of an audience and and getting better at photography. Or even if you aren't, like, I guess the question comes, like, do you need a, do you need an an audience on, on different social medias platforms to, to make it like, and the answer is ultimately no, it can help. But, and I guess interested to, to know your thought on that, whether you, (laughs) you think that, that like you need it. Yeah, so I mean, from my perspective, it's like no real creative who has a, I would say, a a mature skill set in their craft truly ever needs social media specifically exactly to survive, Mm. right? I think there are so many different ways to to make it. Um, There are so many different ways to make money. There are so many different ways to achieve you know, quote unquote, notoriety or, you know, authority and mm. even to a lesser extent fame and, and you know, all that kind of stuff. I think um, there are, I think everyone has a different level with how comfortable they are with using certain uh, techniques over others, Yeah. right? Um, you know, a good example of this in the marketing world is social media, and is things like doing advertising, running paid ads, or you yeah. know, doing marketing campaigns, or, or or doing reach outs, or you know building a sales team, and and, yeah. and all those kind of different things. Um, everyone has their own different level of comfort and discomfort for those things, especially as creatives, because it's it's most likely going to be a newer skill. Yes, as um, it still is for me. <laughs> yeah, and and I think you know it it is it is just about diving in and seeing whether or not you enjoy that process yeah and and then being able to use the tools at your disposal as a creator to to then like find out what you're comfortable in and and how you can use those different avenues to accelerate your own career as a creative person the other thing that i think about a lot and i'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this as well is this idea of like having more of a niche and really sticking to that. So I went down a bit of a path of doing lots of different things and it it paid off to some degree because now I have this skill set where I'm very comfortable doing a range of, of different things. And I like that in some ways, but in many ways it's probably taken me a bit longer to, um, find exactly what I want to be doing. And rather than just kind of narrowing down on that and really sticking to it, I think doubt can kind of get the better of you and you think, okay, maybe I can't keep going. Maybe I'm not going to be successful in that particular path. I need to branch out. Mm. Um, And that's probably what I did a lot of initially um, and trying different things. So I guess I'm still unsure whether I like, I think obviously you can do both, but I think it is really important to, to have some kind of direction. And if you're not having success there, I think just keep pushing as much as you can, because as you say, there's so many different avenues. There's so many, regardless of what you enjoy, whether like if it's photography, whatever it is, whatever you enjoy doing, 
there's different ways you can you can make money from that or survive from doing that. There's no right or wrong way. As long as you stick at it and you keep going that direction, you keep getting better, you keep growing your skills well out, probably well outside that too. But in in the end to help with that, I think that's really important mm. and probably something that's taken me a bit longer to to kind of come to that realization. Yeah, I think in you know to to answer your question back at me in in that regard I personally have been I would say like blessed with a previous career that provided me the skill set to answer that question for myself. Mm-hmm. Um you know in product design we used to think of solving problems in in a, a kind of what's called a, like a double diamond kind of way in which you have this like this problem and the first thing you do is not to 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 borrow down into a particular thing and and, and think okay what do i what do i do in in this particular narrow context it's really about diverging mm. and seeing all the options and surveying the landscape and understanding what's out there and what you can do what potentially you can't do you know chasing these different avenues and seeing what works mm. and then when you do find what works you then converge yeah you really you, double down you and... double down and you narrow but then after that you know when you found your kind of topic category basic kind of building block you diverge again within mm. the same context okay and then you converge again yeah. and so it creates this like kind of double diamond yeah and um little network little yeah and and you're constantly trying to like think okay i'm going broad what's worked i'll focus on that in that context i'll go broad again what works yep. and then you keep doing that and, and and doubling down that's really interesting yeah 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 that, that's kind of what helped me a lot with my own experiments in terms of of what i like in the business and and how i want the business to go and, and lifestyle design and, and yeah all the rest of it yeah so just to finish up yep we've talked about this and, and touched upon this quite a bit but what does success mean for you it ultimately for me means living kind of a lifestyle that you enjoy and allows you to do things that you enjoy <laughs> it's pretty simple but that's pretty much what it comes down to and um, for me, that's like kind of the most important thing in life. And that's why I'm not a like super focused money person. Like as long as you're comfortable, as long as you you can survive and meet all your basic needs and do all those things and still do what you want to do and have time for those things, whether that's photography, family, whatever it is, sport, whatever it is, as long as you, whatever you're doing, have time for those things and you're not just working Mm. and you don't just see it as working and that's taking away from other things that's success to me nice Mm. well tk thank you so much for coming along on this uh very first episode Mm. of made um where can people find you and where can they see your wonderful work uh two main platforms instagram at tk underscore north and youtube tk north nice all one word and Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be on the very first episode and really keen to see where this where this leads for you. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, if you enjoyed that episode, then tap over here for another one that I think that you really might enjoy. Oh, and if you want to support the channel, remember to like and subscribe and let me know your thoughts in the comments below. See you in the next one.